Everybody's attention, please. Uh, if I could remind everybody to please scan this QR code on the table in front of you. Uh, this helps both with CME and also tracking attendance uh, and covering the cost of meals. So if you could please log in with the QR code. Uh, we would really appreciate it. Also like to declare that Dr. Selzer has no conflicts of interest uh, no. either of us knows about. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lexi Selzer. Uh, she joined us three short years ago uh, from University of Pikeville. Uh, and before that, she earned her bachelor degree from University of South Carolina. Uh, she has numerous quality improvement projects as well as community service. Uh, and I'm glad to say that she's going to be joining us as a hospitalist uh, after she completes residency this summer, so that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, and today she is going to talk about caring for the caretakers. Uh, I'll turn it over to her. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, like Dr. Dodd said, I don't have any conflicts of interest or anything like that. No financial agreements, nothing. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, caring for the caretakers, and these are my objectives. Um, so one, I want to define um, children and youth with special health care needs. Um, also define children with medical complexity and the differences between those two. Um, I want to uh, everyone to be able to recognize the difference between formal and informal caregiving, um, as well as recognizing the various stressors that caregivers face, um, and then understanding the goals for optimal health care in children with medical medical complexity um, as defined by the Department of Health and Human Services. So to get started, just a nice little quote. Um, it's not how, how much we give, but how much love we put into giving. Um, and I think that really speaks true to, to this talk. So um, just kind of a little background story on me. Um, this handsome devil right here is my grandfather. Um, he is, um, he was a, a caregiver for as long as I can remember. Um, growing up, my, for as long as I can remember, my grandmother was ill in some way, um, always in the hospital or um, having different medical appointments, um, those kinds of things, and always required some amount of care. Um, and my grandfather always provided that care. Um, he never even entertained the thought of having anyone help to take care of that um, and really dedicated his life to caring for her. Um, and so then um, we knew my grandfather had some health problems, but um, really he was so focused on taking care of her, we never really thought more about it. Um, and then my uh, sophomore year of college, my uh, grandmother passed away. And shortly after she passed away, we noticed some, um, some different kind of abnormalities with my grandfather. And within probably six months of my grandmother passing away, my grandfather was diagnosed with um, Lewy body dementia. And if you don't know what that is or don't remember what that is, kind of in its most dumbed down basic form, that's like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's all rolled into one. So it's, it can definitely be pretty devastating. Um, and so then uh, really throughout college, when I would come home uh, from college, we, I would help take care of my grandfather um, and uh, really kind of get to know him and kind of get to know the, the uh, role of being a caregiver. Um, but that diagnosis was pretty shocking to us and that shocking that it came so soon um, after we thought he was a healthy guy being able to take care of my grandmother. Um, like in our minds, how could a family full of medically minded people, my mom is a nurse who works in long-term care, my dad is a physician, I was going to medical school, how could we not recognize that he had these, um, this devastating diagnosis um, and really it comes down to, we were so focused on my grandmother's health and taking care of my grandmother, making sure that she was well cared for that we never even thought to look at my grandfather and say, what can we do to support him? And what do we, what kind of help does he need? What kind of health care needs does he have? So that was really kind of the inspiration for this talk. Um, and I, I, going through that situation, um, I always thought that's the population of people I wanna take care of. I wanna take care of older patients, geriatric patients, um, and then I went to medical school and did something I never thought I would do, and I fell in love with pediatrics. 
Um, and so, hello, that's why I am here. <laughs> um, and then coming into residency, um, we, as you guys know, we take care of a, a lot of kids with chronic illness. Um, we see them frequently in the outpatient setting. We see them frequently in the hospital. Um, and I think that um, we, uh, our goal is always to get those patients healthy or to keep those patients healthy and get them home, get them home with the supplies they need, get them home with the support that they need. Um, we are constantly making sure that the, the people that are taking care of them have the training that they need to take care of various um, medical supplies or do various medical um, uh, procedures like um, giving IV medications, accessing G-tubes, those kinds of things. Um, and while we uh, like taking care of them and getting them healthy and training the, the families to do all of those kinds of things, um, I've kind of realized that the caretakers are kind of lost in, in their world. Um, so they are really lost in the medical world. They, uh, as you'll see throughout the presentation, we, we, um, we forget that the parent is, the, is also a person and needs to focus on taking care of themselves um, and, and being cared for as well. So my hope for this talk is, is that we can take some time to focus on those, those caretakers and how we can best um, support them. Uh, let's see. So kind of defining chronic illness in children. Um, it uh, is defined, so you'll see it abbreviated CYSHN, um, and uh, children, with, children and youth with special he health care needs is defined as um, those who have a chronic physical, developmental, behavior, or emotional condition that lasts for greater than one year, and those who receive health-related services beyond that required by children generally. Um, those health-related services can be um, anything from increased office visits to subspecialist care um, to therapy needs or even prescriptions that are needed for greater than a year. So um, think about kids that with uh, asthma that need prescriptions for greater than a year, kids with diabetes that are going to be on lifelong medications, things like that. Um, in general, uh, chronicity is defined as illnesses that are prolonged in their duration and that do not resolve spontaneously and that are rarely cured completely. Um, and then the, uh, the subset of that is children with medical complexity and that is defined as two or more chronic conditions or a progressive condition with deteriorating health or decreased life expectancy into adulthood or severe functional limitations or continuous dependency on a device for more than six months or high healthcare use or engagement with multiple, med uh, multiple service providers that may include non-medical providers or progressive or metastatic malignancies that impact life function. Um, so those are kind of the two definitions that I want you to remember throughout the presentation. Children and youth with health special health care needs and then um, chronic illness or children with medical complexity. Um, and that's just kind of a subset of the initial one. So how do we determine what kids are um, classified under that children and youth with special health care needs. Um, there's actually a screener that, um, that we use. Um, it's called the CYSHN screener. Um, so the questions asked to the parents are, are these five questions. Does your child experience any of the following? Use or need of a prescription medication? Above average use or need of medical, mental health, or educational services? Functional limitations compared with others of the same age? Use or need of specialized therapies, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, anything, vision therapy, feeding therapy, any other specialized therapies. Um, and treatment or counseling for emotional, behavior, or devel developmental problems. If the answer to the, any of those questions is yes, then we ask, if yes, is that because of any medical, behavioral, or other health-related condition? And if that answer is yes, is that condition expected to last more than 12 months? Um, so that's really kind of our screener for, uh, for the children and youth with special health care needs. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology of children um, with special health care needs. Um, so nationwide, um, about 19.2% of children have special health care needs. That's 13.1 million children. That's, that's a lot of kids. <laughs> and then in Tennessee, we're kind of right at the national average. About 19.8% of our kids have special health care needs as well. Um, that's about 300,000 children. Um, 
Um, and this information is from uh, the Health Services Youth and Healthcare Expenditure for Children with Disabilities. That uh, was published in Pediatrics. Um, and it surveyed 13, almost 14,000 children between 0 and 18 years old. Um, so then moving into um, a little bit of that more subspecial or subspecial uh, subcategory, um, nationwide about 3% of children are classified as children with medical complexity, and that's 3 million children. So that is still a huge amount of kids that are needing these special services. Um, and about 500,000 of those children are requiring the highest level of care necessary. Um, in the outpatient world, um, Children, well, in general, children are not only living longer with these uh, special conditions, um, but they're also living longer on more aggressive treatments that have harsher side effects. Um, so that is contributing to our healthcare costs with these kids. Um, for outpatient care, these kids um, have double the number of outpatient visits as their healthy peers, and the most complex kids are having four times the number of outpatient visits per year. Um, on average, the... Um, Children with medical complexity are having about 34 outpatient visits for, per year. So that's almost three visits per month that these kids have um, just visiting outpatient providers. Um, and then hospital admission days, um, you can look the 55 days per 1,000 for peers without disability. And, and these kids are having 464 days per 1,000 um, uh, in hospital admission. So that is a huge number. Um, this, can you see it? Can you see that? Um, it's a little bit small, but you can kind of see it. Um, so this is kind of the demographics of children with, med with complex medical needs. Um, and more complex being defined as uh, the need for medical care, need for more medical care than usual. Um, and then answering three out of those four items on that screen are being positive, um, as well as the medical equipment use and seeing two or more subspecialists in the last 12 months. Um, so compared with the less complex children with special health care needs, uh, more complex patients are more li likely to be younger. So you can see right there, um, the more complex patients are between that 6 and 11 year old age group, and then kind of our less complex patients are between that 12 and 17 year old age group. Um, they are more likely to be male, um, and they are more likely to be um, white, um, Caucasian. And then um, more likely to be from the South. So we have a much higher percentage here in the South um, of medically complex children than there are anywhere else in the country. Um, and that's true for both the less complex and more complex kids. Uh, let's see. Did they also talk about like if that's mental disability or physical? Like did they also? Yeah, so that is goes into that definition of um, the, so the, there's the, uh, Let's see, the less complex column and the more complex column. Um, the less complex can be any of those kids with uh, special health care needs that, as we defined in the beginning, and the more complex being those ones that see two or more health care providers, um, have three of the positive questions, uh, three, of the posit three of the question out of four questions positive on the screener, and then um, having medical equipment use. So I thought this was a cool little picture talking about chronic illness um, in the United States. Um, and it's important to look at this when, we're, when we uh, consider these uh, leading diagnoses. So asthma is the leading cause of chronic illness, um, followed by ADHD and autism. Um, other big things, there's about 13,000 new diagnoses of uh, type 1 diabetes every year, um, and about 1.25 million American, Americans living with type 1 diabetes. Um, and then... Uh, children with medical complexity, those with cerebral palsy, epilepsy, genetic disorders, as we talked about earlier, um, make up about 3% of the total population of these kids. And then this chart shows the many different diagnoses um, under that umbrella. Um, and it also looks at the different complexity between the two. Um, so the less complex being that uh, darker color, the more complex being that more gray color, that lighter gray color. Um, and so you can see the diagnoses with higher complexity are those with uh, like cerebral palsy um, and seizure disorders. Those have the most disproportionate between less complex and more complex. Uh, let's see. So when you uh, look at 
uh, this chart, um, it talks about that, this is that screener, and it's asked um, additional questions and what percentage of those kids that had a positive screener, um, what percent, what had the highest percentage um, were their primary problem. Um, so 51% had some kind of learning, understanding, or paying attention disorder. Um, and then next on that list was breathing or respiratory problems. Um, and then uh, the, the highlighted ones are like our top five. Um, so then feeling anxious and depressed, um, and then behavior problems, and then speaking and communicating and being understood. Um, among the 14 difficulties asked here, 91.2% experienced at least one of those difficulties, and 72% experienced two or more. Um, about half of those, 45%, experienced four or more of these problems on that screener. Sorry, I'm really sniffly. I had a, I have a cold. <laughs> Um, and so this kind of looks a little bit more in depth at that. So uh, that screener that we talked about earlier, 46% um, or so qualified, but just based on one screener, and then 20% on two screener criteria, 14% on three, and 20% and on four or five. Um, so that's a pretty, uh, you can see the population estimates down there too. Those are pretty significant numbers. And that's just in Tennessee. That's not nationwide. Um, and then just kind of delving further into those screener results. Um, so like we said, about 20% um, test positive for that screener. Um, and this kind of defines it functional limitations um, versus just prescription medications that you need, um, specialized services, and then prescription medication and specialized services. And those are about 5% of the kids. So we'll talk a little bit about the economics of chronic illness. So about 1% of children, and they're mostly children with medical complexity, that subset, um, account for a third of all healthcare spending in children. Um, about 10% of hospital admissions are kids with medical complexity, and that 10% makes up 41% of hospital charges. It's about $100 billion. That's that's outrageous to me. That's crazy that that small subset of children can make up that much, um, that much um, economically. Um, hospital admission rates of children with medical complexity are equal or greater than that than elderly Medicare patients, um, which is another uh, crazy statistic. And then many of those kids have about have five or more hospital admissions per year. Um, more than half of families of children with medical complexity report paying more than $1,000 for uh, out-of-pocket health care expenses over one year. And when you think about that and think about the families that we see here, think about it in general. Not many people have a spare $1,000 to spend. Um, but also think about our patient population, and I know for certain that they don't have a spare $1,000 to spend out-of-pocket. Um, so that's really kind of the basics of chronic illness, um, and I just wanted to establish that basis so we can move into talking about um, caregiving and, and um, how best to care for our caretakers. Um, so kind of the basics of caregiving, formal caregivers are our professional caregivers that are per paid to provide um, caregiving services. So those are our health professionals, whether it's um, nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, therapists, speech therapists, um, direct support professionals like case managers and social workers. Um, and then, so those are the two kind of subsets. And so they may work in the home, they may work in group homes, foster homes, in hospitals, nursing facilities, kind of they work all over. Um, and then informal caregivers, it's pretty self-explanatory, but those are the unpaid individuals. So that's usually families or friends um, that are providing assistance with activities of daily living and other medical tasks. Um, so formal caregivers often work with a particular patient for um, weeks or months or years um, and develop those long-lasting bonds um, with the patients. And while formal caregivers are paid for their services, it's important to remember that doesn't diminish um, their connection with their re the recipient of their care, obviously. Um, formal caregivers have the added stresses of new coworker dynamics, um, unstable work environment, changes in location, changes in the hours worked on top of the other stressors that come with caregiving in general. Um, the most common stressors that formal caregivers um, report is um, ambiguity in roles, um, work and home conflicts, um, bureaucracy, uh, lack of support from other staff, and behavioral and health problems with their care recipi recipients, and then limited job autonomy. 
Um, so this is kind of the demographics of our caregivers. Um, you can see the, the column in green is of our child recipients um, and the column in orange is of our adult recipients. So you can see the majority of caregivers are female. Um, the majority of them are between the ages of 35 and 49. Um, and the majority of them are married. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the demographics of that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the epidemiology as well. So um, about 29% of the U.S. population um, provides care for a chronically ill or disabled family member or friend in an informal setting. That's, so that's 65 million people. Um, these numbers are just like mind-blowing to me. 14% um, of those caregivers are caring for children with special health care needs under the age of 18. So that's about 16.8 million people. 55% um, are caring for their own children. We have a lot of grandparents caring for these kids. So about 18% are, are grandparents caring for these kids. And then 1% um, are caring for a sibling. So um, whether it's an, a, an adult sibling care, taking care of a younger sibling or even a, an older child caring for, for a younger sibling. Um, and so that next slide, 1.4 million children between the ages of 8 and 18 are providing care for an adult relative in their home. Um, and I don't think that's something that we screen for or that we ask very often. Um, we just assume that they're not. <laughs> Um, and so um, then approximately 65% of caregivers are female, like I said, with an average age of 40.6. 44% um, of the informal caregivers of children report to be the sole caregivers. And even those that have help, uh, receive help with caregiving duties, 67 report that they still provide the most care for those kids. Um, so kind of the economics of it all. On average, informal caregivers provide about 20 hours of direct care per week, um, and, but 25% of informal caregivers report spending 40 plus hours providing direct care. Um, and the, when you look at the estimated value of that, about 400 and the, the care that's given is estimated at about $470 billion per year. Um, so if they were to be paid for their services, that is about how much it would cost us. Um, that is more than paid home care and total Medicaid spending for a year. Um, so that's pretty significant. Uh, next, we'll move into talking about caregiver stresses. So why are these guys stressed out? Why does it, you know, it's not that hard, right? Well, this is a care map um, of one patient with a chronic illness. Um, so this is, uh, like I said, one child with medical complexity that sees several different subspecialists. You can see there they are seeing endocrinology, genetics, cardiology, uh, GI, ophthalmology, and ortho. Um, they go to two different subspecialty hospitals um, where they receive care. They are going to school. Um, and have school issues. Uh, they are also going to um, a bunch of different therapies that they are having to deal with. Um, this family is involved in support groups. Um, they also run a blog. Um, so yeah, you can see this is, uh, this is one child in one family with special health care needs. This is a care map for a family with three children with special health care needs. Um, if that doesn't make your head spin, I don't know what will. Um, <laughs> this is um, one, child, one child with uh, more complex medical needs um, and then two children um, with a little bit less complex um, but still seeing several different subspecialists. Um, yeah, that's pretty intense. Um, so what are they worried about? What are caregivers looking for online? I found this cool study that asked, what did you look for? What are you, what, um, and in my mind that translates to, what are you most worried about? Um, and so 81% uh, are looking for information related to their, uh, their child's uh, condition or treatment. Um, they're looking for services available to um, people with, or for people with uh, your child's, that child's condition. Um, specific information about caregiving tasks. They're looking for doctors, um, other doctors or other healthcare professionals to help. Um, and then kind of a smaller subset are looking for how, how can I be supported? What kind of support can I get as a caregiver? Um, so there's really like five main categories that I, I 
kind of separate it all out into. So financial stress is a big one. Um, it's reported in 57% of families um, and 54% of caregivers report having to quit working to provide care. Um, a lack of insurance and a lack of adequate insurance are also significant stressors. Um, emotional stress is another one, uncertainty about the future, about treatment choices, um, upcoming procedures, appointments, those kinds of things, even getting to appointments. Um, and then guilt about the care being provided. Am I providing adequate care? Am I spending enough time? Um, and guilt about having somebody else providing care as well. So not being able to provide all of the care within the home. Um, physical stress, lack of sleep, uh, lack of ability to exercise, lack of routine. Uh, social stress, so social isolation, um, feeling like uh, their family is a burden anytime they try to go out or participate in any social kind of environments, and then personal stress, so personal illness, disability, those kinds of things. Um, so looking at financial stress, this is uh, kind of another uh, part of that same survey that I just showed you. Um, this is work accommodations. So um, in your experience as both a worker and a caregiver, did you ever go in late or take time, go in late, leave early or take time off? Almost everybody says yes. Um, take a leave of absence and you can see that green bar is our child recipients and those are so much higher than our adult recipients. Um, so yeah, take a leave of absence, reduce your work hours, um, give up working entirely. Um, about 21% of families gave up, or caregivers gave up working entirely in order to care for these kids. Um, and then turn down a promotion or choose early retirement. Um, so let's see, caregiver health. Um, it's long been reported that um, caregiving has been associated with poor, poor physical outcomes. Um, 23% of caregivers report their own health as fair or poor, um, but 72% of those same caregivers report that they don't go to the doctor as often as they should, um, even skipping their own appointments in order to accommodate their patients' needs. Um, physical health, um, highly stressed caregivers have been found time and time again to have a decreased immune system functioning as well as subsequent greater risk of infection and poorer wound healing. Um, adverse changes in blood pressure and increased risk of cardiovascular disease have also been reported. And then psychological health. Um, there's a substantial increase in clinical depression and major depressive symptoms with um, about 40 to 70 percent of caregivers reporting symptoms of clinical depression and about 25 percent of those reporting major depressive symptoms including thoughts of suicide. So we talk about burnout a lot as healthcare professionals, but caregiver burnout is also a thing. So what is it? It's, it's what we, um, def same thing we define it as in the healthcare profession. So emotional exhaustion, um, feelings of being emotionally overextended and exhausted at one's work. Um, depersonalization, um, so an unfeeling and impersonal response toward recipients of one's patients. Um, reduced personal achievement, so decreased feelings of competency and accomplishment in, in one's work. Um, and uh, so informal caregivers, um, we think that the burnout results um, not only from personal closeness uh, with patients, um, but uh, other factors as well. And then formal caregivers burnout um, stems from like a, a lot of different things. So their personal relationship with that patient um, that they form over the years or weeks or months or that they work with them as well as their own emotional state, um, unpredictable work environment, and then conflicts with peers. Um, caregiver burnout not only uh, affects a caregiver's own well-being, but it also impacts their performance um, with their health caregiving uh, duties as well as interactions with their patients. Um, so if they obviously are not happy and not doing well emotionally um, and physically, then the, the care that's being provided can definitely um, be affected by that. So factors that are increase the risk of caregiver depression and burnout are um, tending to someone with disruptive behavior. Um, and we saw earlier um, in that slide that I showed that uh, a lot of these kids with medical complexity have some kind of behavioral issues. Um, so that uh, is definitely a big one for our population. Um, tending to someone with personality changes caused by neurological conditions, um, frequent conflict with the healthcare team, and then lacking appropriate support. Um, so from our perspective as physicians, um, there have been two kind of definitions of, of 
um, what our goals are as physicians for these families and these kids. Um, so our goals for optimal health care in children with medical complexity, um, we want to maximize health function, um, health function development and family functioning through coordinated and family-centered care. And then we want to provide proactive rather than reactive care so that critical medical and health events um, are avoided as much as possible. And then the Institute of Health also defined these aims of high quality health care um, as being safe, meaning avoiding injuries to the patient, um, as being effective, meaning that services provided are based on scientific knowledge, um, being patient-centered, uh, meaning that care is respectful of the patient's preferences, needs, and values, um, being timely, so reducing our wait times and delays, being efficient, so avoiding waste, and then being equitable, that care does not uh, vary because of personal characteristics. Um, so going back to that same study, these are uh, topics that um, caregivers said they need help with or they need more information on. Um, so just kind of picking out a few of these um, easy activities that they can do with the, pa the patients that they're providing care for, um, managing their, um, their own emotional and physical stress, um, and finding time for themselves, those are, those are big ones, um, as well as um, balancing work and family responsibilities, and then keeping the patient safe at home. Um, you can see that uh, managing challenging behaviors, when you look at that green bar, which is our kids, is significantly higher um, in kids than it is in the, the adult population, um, as well as talking to doctors and other healthcare professionals. So um, uh, people want help talking to us in, um, in making healthcare decisions. Um, this is kind of just another survey that says, what are the problems that they're facing in our, in our healthcare world? Um, so problems getting needed referrals, um, not receiving effective care coordination, uh, having trouble with health insurance, and then um, we actually do a pretty good job with our medical home. Uh, well, better than the, the adult medical home, so about 56% of our families say that they have a good medical home that they can come to. Um, um, so what can we do? Uh, we have kind of three new models of care that we're working on, and we've kind of worked on some of them here at our hospital, and hopefully we'll get them going in the next few years. So one is an integrated outpatient complex care program. Um, one is our care managers, and then the other one is our care coordinators. And we'll talk a little bit about all three of those. Um, so integrated care models, those are uh, clinics that are dedicated solely to the care of children with medical complexity. Um, so providers um, work to provide care across the continuum, moving from outpatient to emergency care to inpatient care as needed. Um, and then they also work with a variety of community programs and care groups to coordinate care for both patients and their families. Um, so um, when you're seeing those complex kids, you're not just seeing the kids for their appointments, you're also possibly seeing parents for appointments too and providing healthcare for parents at the same time because how easy would that be? How, how much easier for our families would that be? The next kind of model of care are care managers. So uh, they're healthcare providers. Um, they communicate directly with patients and families um, to communicate healthcare needs, provide support, and maintain accurate and updated medical records. Um, some of the benefits of that, um, we reduce the unmet health care needs, um, increases the family's knowledge of the child's health condition, and I think that's a huge one looking forward. Um, improving coping with the child's health care condition, um, reduces caregiver burden, and improves uh, family satisfaction with care. Um, so there's actually been studies on this that show that implementation of the quality care managers has shown to increase outpatient visits by 70% which may sound crazy, but it's good. We want them to be seen as outpatient because it reduces their inpatient admissions by 26 to 50%, which is ultimately what we want. We don't want them here in the hospital if they don't have to be here in the hospital. Um, emergency department visits were decreased significantly. Um, and then, like I said, uh, hospital admission days were also decreased significantly. Um, and so then next, talking about care coordination. Um, uh, a clearly defined family-centered team is defined with two goals in mind. One, to fulfill the child's health care needs by creating a foundation um, of needs to optimize the child's health and quality of life and ensuring that those needs are met. And then two, to provide proactive care planning 
um, by creating guidelines to manage any future complications. Um, so the, the needs uh, of these kids are extensive and include medical treatment and, and diagnostic tests and health services. And it's not uncommon for a child to have 24 plus healthcare needs um, and sometimes over 10 providers. Um, so we do run into some barriers with implementation of, of these um, programs um, and that can include difficulty with coordination um, because you have so many different healthcare providers um, as well as insurmountable amount of uh, planning and paperwork um, and then interruptions in care due to multiple health events. So um, while the idea is to keep them out of the hospital if at all possible, those, those healthcare events that in, land them in the hospital often make it difficult um, to help with the care coordination. Um, so how can we better plan um, and help these families plan for the future. How can we take that, hopefully take some of that stress off of care planning? Um, so these are 10 questions that I think are really good um, to ask. Uh, so which aspects of the child's health are likely to get better or worse over time? Uh, what acute illnesses can we predict will happen in the future? Um, are there exacerbations of chronic illnesses that, this kid, that these kids are going to experience? Um, what new comorbid conditions can we look to in the future? Can we go ahead and start planning for? Um, and then how can we avoid those, thing, avoid those things altogether? Is there any way to prevent them in the future? Um, if they're unavoidable, then how can we uh, mitigate their severity? Um, and then what major medical needs, um, equipment, subspecialty stuff, medications, all of that stuff is the child likely to need in the future? Um, have we made decisions about medical interventions? Um, are we um, going to do major surgeries? Um, are, are we looking at putting in a G-tube? Are we looking at tracking patients? Um, what major medical interventions um, are we okay with? Um, is the family okay with in the future? Um, and then obviously what is the likely impact on the family? Um, and then what will life be like for this kid in one year, 10 years, five years, whatever it may be? Are we expecting them to rapidly deteriorate or are we expecting them to kind of hold their own for the next few years? Um, so these are all uh, questions that I think we need to be asking when we're talking about planning for these kids' futures. Um, so really lastly, um, all I have is, uh, is how can we help? How uh, do we, better help these uh, caregivers. Um, so caregivers are often the most knowledgeable people about um, these kids' needs and signs and symptoms of illness and the effectiveness of various treatments and interventions. They're the ones that are home with these kids when we're implementing these interventions. They're seeing if things are, are helping or hurting. Um, and so uh, we need to be able to openly talk with uh, caregivers and listen to our caregivers and what they're telling us. So. Um, the first one on the list, be an active listener. Um, don't uh, just focus on the child at hand, uh, focus on the family as a whole. Um, so we wanna be able to provide them with available support services for the child and for the family. Um, you wanna encourage learning skills that are gonna aid in caregiving, um, encourage building an informal network of support. Um, participate, um, get everyone to participate, whether it's in support groups or it's um, caregiving itself um, or a caregiving association. Do you want everyone to participate, everyone in the family to participate if possible and everyone to take some responsibility for that care? Um, promote collab collaboration, um, encourage the use of respite care. I think that's something that a lot of families have trouble um, recognizing that is needed. Um, so um, there's a, sometimes can be some guilt associated with saying, hey, I need help, I need a break, um, and that's okay. And we have respite care services just for that reason. Um, we obviously want to encourage them to be attentive to their own health. Um, if they are not at their top health, then they cannot provide the best care for these kids. Um, and then encourage future planning. It's something that nobody likes to talk about. Um, uh, that includes palliative care um, and end of life planning as well. Nobody likes to talk about the future in those kind of terms, but um, I think it's important to plan for those things so that in the future should need arise, then we, there's a clear cut um, plan for what we're gonna do. Um, and then provide clear and detailed explanations of what needs to be done and how we're gonna achieve those goals. Um, yeah, 
and then I, it's not on the list, but acknowledge that burnout is a real thing um, and that it happens and it happens to almost everyone. Um, and it's completely understandable and we're here to help if you need it. Um, I have a list of resources here, um, some stuff that I came across on this in preparing this presentation. Um, so Children's Special Services in Tennessee is not something I knew about until maybe two months ago. Um, it is, um, they provide um, coverage for comprehensive medical care and other uh, non-medical resources for kids with physical disabilities and special health care needs from the time they're born until they're 21 years of age. Um, of course, it depends on various diagnostic and financial eligibility, but the program is available through all 95 health departments in the state. Um, they have two components, so medical services and care coordination. Um, so the medical services part can provide reimbursement for medical services, such as outpatient visits, hospital visits, um, therapies, medical equipment, and medications, and then provides um, educational, medical, social, transportation, support, and advocacy for all families and patients. Um, the, if you go to that website, you can see what kids qualify, what families qualify for um, those services. But that's, um, I think, a super valuable resource that we don't take advantage of enough. Um, and I certainly didn't know that it was available to us until a couple months ago, probably. Um, another one I found, the National Alliance for Caregiving. Um, it's dedicated to improving uh, quality of life for families and their care recipients. They do a lot of research um, and advocacy for caregivers. Um, they have four main areas of focus, um, research, innovation, technology, state and local uh, caregiving coalitions, and then international caring is something that they recently started. Um, the next one, Complex Child, it's a, a monthly online magazine. Um, it's written by parents of children with special health care needs and disabilities. Um, it's intended to provide uh, medical information and personal experiences. Um, it's written in kind of simple language that uh, all parents can understand and they articles they arrange have a wide range of topics. Anything from basic information on medical conditions to treatments and advice and even stuff on insurance help. Um, and then the last one, um, St. Jude has an incredible website for caregiver resources of uh, friends and family, so they have an abundance of information. Um, anything from patient and parent education about different diagnoses, um, different procedures, technologies like feeding tubes and tricks and stuff like that, um, infection control tips, um, and then information about medication, um, medication storage, um, adverse effects, school forms even. Um, that is, they have an incredible website um, to, to be able to provide for these families. Uh, so that's really about it. Um, I uh, think that this quote definitely ring, rings true and it pertains to this, to, to this talk. Um, you know, we just have to really take care of these families. Um, I think that, like I said in the beginning, these families kind of get lost. The parents get lost in the medical world. Um, and so how can we best help them to be their best selves? Um, I think that's an import, a really important um, uh, direction that we can take um, with these families. That's all I have. Lots of references. <laughs> Any questions, comments, concerns? All right. I thought that was an excellent talk. Uh, just some, something that was kind of interesting. Uh, I thought it was interesting. A lot of the statistics showed that maybe support groups would have a powerful impact, you know, with giving parents something to take their kids to, like activity-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's something, um, definitely an improvement that we can try to make here uh, in our community. I, there, is, there aren't a lot of support groups and talking with various families to make this talk. Um, uh, I tried to figure out if there were uh, support, local support groups for caregivers and stuff like that. And the majority of people I talked to said there's stuff online, but there's not a whole lot here in Johnson City. Um, so I think a, as a community as a whole, that's something that we need to work on and make things more accessible for these families and these kids. Yes? Did you come across any 
the benefit of social media support groups? These are a big thing now for complex children. They post every update. Yeah, um, and so I, I didn't find any specific information about that, but yes, there are a ton of social media groups. Um, and I think that any kind of um, story sharing um, among kids or families with of kids with similar conditions can be can be beneficial just to show that there is support there are other kids and other families living with these kind of conditions um, so yeah I think I definitely think it's beneficial I didn't find anything specifically about are it are there informal support groups on social media that you came across like Facebook yes there's there a lot really you can just type in Facebook whatever condition you are looking for and you will find something <laughs> Yes. I'll echo uh, Dr. Dodd's compliment. Very, very nice uh, presentation. I really appreciated how you kind of wrapped it up for us with a list of things to things to do for these families. I have more of a reflection than a question. Sure. Um, when you were going through all the things that the families are asking of us, it struck me those are things that we don't do very well ourselves. No. Nope. <laughs> talk about like striking work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how to deal with burnout, how to support one another. It seems a little difficult to, to address and, and give them good advice on their needs when, quite frankly, I'm struggling every day to do mm -hmm. that myself. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that that um, is definitely a struggle for us because we it's kind of, an, uh, in our minds, it's normal everyday life for us, and we're like, well, we're dealing with it. And we don't think to ask other people, how how can we help you deal with it so you don't have to feel like I feel? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's definitely a, a balance that, that we definitely need to work on. Yes, Dr. Wood. Thank you for an excellent talk. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that seems surprising is how little we know about what happens to them after they finish with us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to put in a shameless plug, Dr. Uh, Dawn and I are going to be adding a transition component to our adolescent clinic, where we will basically be having a clinic for medical complex adolescents to help them transition into adult care. And a couple of things that happen that are big changes for adolescents and adults is, I mean, what's the main support system for these families? It's the schools. And even if you have a child who's very, very impaired, they have them in school six to eight hours a day. And that ends usually at 18 or 22. And then so what happens after that? So there, and as well, the adult healthcare system, we're at least set up to take care of these, many of these children. Not well, I think there's a lot of gaps in our care coordination and systems of care for medical complexity are still lacking in many places, including this area. But when you get to the adult world, it's a desert. I mean, mm -hmm. it's an absolute desert. So there is a lot of opportunity when you go out and practice to communicate with adult providers that you're handing your patients off to, because they need our help to know how to take care of these, these young people. Thank you. All right. It's been real. Later. Oh, yes. Uh, and then uh, I, I enjoyed the parts of the talk that I could hear as well. I, I have a question to ask, perhaps out of a hospitalist ignorance. Um, you know, are, are there such a thing as sort of care, bond, care bundles for chronic diseases at, in the outpatient arena for children? Uh, you know, obviously care bundles get utilized a lot in the adult population for specific chronic diagnoses. And they, they get implemented on the inpatient side, not infrequently, but are there are there outpatient care bundles? Is there a, is there a cerebral palsy bundle? A, 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 is there a way to sort of standardize this across healthcare systems and stuff? And do these things exist? Or anybody know? I mean, there's actually research going on in some demonstration projects from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Innovation Center. This is a hot topic around children's healthcare because of the utilization of uh, resources and the you know the the reimbursement for resources and things that these families need, like physical nutrition support, uh, medical equipment, and coordinating those equipment. That isn't reimbursed very well. Even primary care uh, is not reimbursed very well. So kind of the core of these services are not reimbursed, 
and they're overspending because of lack of those services in the hospital. So there's major demonstrations going on, and there's actually legislation coming that may change how care is financed for kids with medical complexity, where we may get a bundled payment. We may get a capitated payment if they qualify, and that way we can spend it on front-end services that could prevent the hospitalizations or the high-end services from happening. But that's not yet in place in very many. Some states do have more proactive Medicaid programs that have contracted with children's hospitals and paid them differently to take care of this group of patients, but not in many places, not universal. 